freak out when you drive out onto the ice? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I think about something that employers can do tomorrow to, to make uh, their employees' experience a little bit better, especially during the wintertime. Spend $250 and get them a remote start. They're going to go through the work. They're going to pass their driver's license. Spend $250. Let them get into a warm car because that, uh, that makes Minnesota winners all the better. So um, in that first session that we had in October, Joe McCabe, talked about, again, the experience of St. James and Medelia and how it hasn't always been easy. And a group of women initially got together and said, enough is enough. What we have here is special. We need to embrace the change. We need to welcome new cultures, provide a welcoming community. And so today we have Sue Harris, uh, formerly a, uh, or currently a uh, community director uh, for uh, the St. James. And um, Sue Harris was a part of that inaugural uh, conversation with Uniting Cultures about how, how can we do better. And I'll let Sue tell more of that story. Um, she's really going to share her experiences as uh, an organizational leader of the Uniting Cultures and how communities um, can find opportunities and challenges, how we can host these welcoming uh, ceremonies and celebrations to really showcase our appreciation and welcome them. And so please uh, help me welcome Sue Harris. How lucky am I? I get to close this thing out. So I have got my clock here and I know five o'clock, so I talk fast. <laughs> so anyway, thinking about all of this and um, processing, I'm so glad I came because it, it's been a fabulous afternoon. The circle is small in Southern Minnesota. Diane and I shared a room when we had our second children together. So I know, I know Joe, he's got relationships. And Jim, his wife is our, my partner and one of the biggest champions in St. James. Um, Wes Beck and his wife and Paul and I are going on a vacation together. Uh, Jen from Pioneer Bank, I mean, this is small, rural Southern Minnesota. We are connected. And um, best of all, this piece that I'm sharing this afternoon has been part of something that I worked with Allie on. And so the front part of all of this, because I only had a half an hour and we did this for an hour, I had to chop a lot out. So I'm only telling our particular story. And my champion, Pat, is um, gone. She is actually bringing greetings from Germany. So uh, we couldn't bring her in from Germany this afternoon, so I'm your girl. And I am proud to be from Southern Minnesota. I grew up on a farm and corn and soybeans and pork is also my background. And the one thing that I know about being part of a small community is I have lived in St. James for 40 years and I'm still a newcomer. And some of you laugh, but if you're from a small community, you were born and raised or you're a newcomer. And the newcomers kind of generally hang together, and those that are born and raised, you're all laughing. This is what small town is kind of about. And so um, I am not originally from, I am from actually Donnell and Sherburne in Martin County. So my community is St. James, Minnesota. And I've lived there. I got married, and I've lived there for over 40 years. And so it's a railroad town, and it's a rural town. And... Food processing and agriculture is our name of the game. But we've had a shift. And that shift happened, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And the reason being is economic development. Our food processing plants did not have the labor force they needed. And so it's interesting as, as we've looked through why people come and the reasons um, for immigration. Well, the first folks that came were from McAllen, Texas. And our uh, plant in Watwan County looked for labor force, had a connection with uh, McAllen, Texas, and brought up young men. The next wave is then, then families came. We had migrant status and a movement, and then they made their home and their staying. So, we are now in community 38% and in our schools, we're well over now 50% in our schools, our Latinx population. That shift and that change affects the entire community. And so how then? We can embrace that change and say this is good. 
and how are we going to manage it and how are we going to celebrate it or we can push against it. And in St. James, we've had a little bit of both. So this is the story of St. James and how we've moved forward. So in the late 90s, we, in fact, Dave Krause was one of the people that helped to fund the spirit of St. James. We were demographically changing. And so um, the business community hired a consultant and we came into St. James. We took 100 people to Fairmont and we processed a whole day of what's going on in our community and what can we do to uh, manage that. And one of the things that came out of that was the Unity Unidad group. Well, the Unity Unidad group, guess who was on that group? It was all the white people. We are not at a point, at that point in history, where we were connected. We had the Latinx community, and we had the white community, and they were living in these parallel universes where they were not connecting and talking with each other, only the kids at school. But it was a start. We had one Latinx business, and they came in for a brief time, and we tried. And we had some focus groups, and we listened, but it was the start. In the mid-2000s then, and what I'm hoping to tell you is that it isn't just one thing that St. James has done. It's been layering of thing after thing after thing to get to a tipping point that it makes the difference. So in the mid-2000s, we were part of our Horizons poverty reduction because we're also a low-income community. And I think the slide before showed the, the um, free and reduced lunch rates. Um, at that point, there was a decided effort by the poverty reduction through the University of Minnesota, and it was funded through um, uh, James J. Hill, and that foundation brought this to Minnesota. And we were one of the communities, and we took our Latinx community and paralleled them. We did leadership plenty, and we had a whole group that was done all in Spanish, talking about what it means to be a leader, what it means to, to run an organization and how to do that. And we had our high school students um, participate and help to lead. Out of that group, we had a woman who finally, um, first Latinx person to run for office in St. James, was a part of that group. Our high school student now works for the ACLU and was one of the student leaders for Leadership Plenty. And it was the first time that our Latinx population said, we need a shelter at our, at our um, tr uh, trailer park where many of them lived because the kids had to stand in Minnesota winters and we want them to be sheltered. Our community wrapped around and that got done. So it was the first time the community responded to red dotting something and then making sure that that happened. So then, what was the tipping point? Well, out of Leadership Plenty, many of the people that took that Leadership Plenty then became part of Covavencia Hispana, which was a group that was engaged with the Latinx population, supporting themselves and being advocacy. Secondly, rhetoric on immigration and border issues is really important for our community. Because in our community, I know and care for both people that are documented and are not documented. They're in my schools, they are my friends, and they are my neighbors. And so many people with this negative rhetoric, this is our people and this is our community. And there were many people at that point in time that were upset. And then Region 9 came in, and I believe it's with the w YWCA, I believe, is... Um, the Forum on Race in the spring of 2017. That forum was a catalyst because when we had the forum, do you want to do something next? And a vast majority of people said yes. And when they said yes, that next step then, Covavencia, we have a group of passionate people that want to do something, this joint meeting tipping point. You can go to the next slide. Uniting Cultures was born in 2017. And we created a mission statement and we became formal about the things that we wanted to do. 
Acceptance, belonging, community, pride and ownership. This is where we are, diversity. It's the way we are together. And so that has begun our journey. So what has Uniting Cultures done? Celebrating the diversity and community, providing educational opportunities to challenge ourselves personally and as a group. Most importantly, we've built relationships. It's relationships that make a difference. And we have not those parallel universes. How do we do things that we can do together so that we can build trust in a relationship and we can hear each other and see each other? Um, support. Our Uniting Cultures has been extremely supportive, both financially and programmatically, for what Cova Vencia Hispana wants to do. And we've done a lot of personal growth because diversity and equity starts in my heart and in my thought. And I have been humbled greatly by diversity and equity work. And I have a long way to go in understanding and being a good um, partner in this diverse world that we are now changing. Um, and then, how do we sustain a group? You have Stormy Norman, your group is going, and then shh, how do you not let it? Shh, this is too important to our community. So how do we sustain it over the long haul? Strategic planning and then fiscal financial issues. So the challenges. OK, we're learning in a multicultural environment. What do other people need? We have a different language. We need to do all of our meetings in Spanish and English. And how long does that take? Twice as long. You can't go fast, and I go fast. So it's slowing yourselves down to be able to do and understand how you do formal structures, um, how you operate meetings, how you do, what ideas and how it flows, and how do you be respectful for differences. Um, the financial, how do you do a community group what doesn't have any money? We, we really like, didn't have any money, and it's been an absolute miracle of the support that we have had in the work and the things that we've done. How do you sustain it? How do you focus and prioritize because there's all these different things that you can do? And do you have social capital loss? Have, ha, is it hard? And do you get pushback? Absolutely. Absolutely. None of this is easy. Change is hard. It's hard work for a lot of people. Some people walk into change well, and some people, it is very, very, very challenging. And so have we had pushback? Yes. How do you continue to develop leadership so you don't burn out? And our successes. We've been recognized in St. James as some leadership in that, and that has really been due to a lot. I'd have to just give Pat great credit because she's been our leader, and she has brought us forward in a lot of things that have pushed us to do new things. And um, we, um, along with Allie, uh, spoke at the National Association for Development Organizations in Portland, Oregon. And they called and wanted to do a national piece on um, DVD or whatever. So we presented online, and then they put that in their archives to what you can do in community. And what Pat will say is that we may not be doing it well, but we're doing it. And that's the point, is that you have to start. And you have to take the effort to do some things. It isn't about just saying, well, my community's changing, and I can't do anything. Yes, we can. It's taking the challenge to, to move that forward. Um, and some of our successes, the best things is that I have a whole group of people that, as Pat said, lived in my community, and I never knew them. I never knew they were there. How is it that we live in small communities, and I recognize this, but there's a whole group of people and particularly the people that might be Latinx or undocumented or whatever, what, wonderful people. But I missed that, and I didn't know that. How do you create the avenue of opening that up to building relationships and seeing other people? And how do you, how do you, what does it mean to belong to your community? Is it if you just look like me? If there are other people, how do we create that sense of belonging, that sense of engagement and participation? And then huge ripple effects. 
and for some of the work that we've done, for the first time in 25 years, I feel included and a part of the work of this community. How did we miss this whole group of people that didn't feel they had an avenue or a place to be a part? Next slide. So, Uniting Cultures was our forum on race. And thank you, excellent programming, and it was wonderful. Shocking. This is about our local churches. We had 80 people, but it wasn't just the white people. And that's because Covivencia Hispana, and there was multiple people, helped to bring people. So we had a very diverse group. And that night, over 80 people struggled with those topics and all of this and said, we can't stop here. So we had a sign-up sheet as we left. How many want to come next? We took that challenge down, and Region 9, thank you to Region 9, provided us with ongoing support. So we did strategic planning with some extension educators, and we decided, what do we want to do? So the next slide. This cultural iceberg, everyone has seen this. So we, when I think about our work, we did everything at the very beginning that was easy and that was above the line. Holidays, festivals, um, the literature piece, dress, food, all of this. You'll see that our first start was all above the line. As we've worked, moved through time, we've gone down to deeper, harder, and um, more engaging and challenging efforts. But if you want to know where to start, start at the top. So our start was, the next slide. Um, that summer in 2017, Ever Vargas, he is one of our champions, and um, Ever said, we need a festival to bring us together. Well, we thought, okay, this was July. Let's see what we can do for next year. Because as white people, we have finances to raise. We have all of these things that we need to do. He said, no, we want to do one on Mexican Independence Day in September. And this was July. And we're going like, there is no way. But Ever said, yes, we can. And you know what? Yes, we can. We had our first ever multicultural independent, or, um, celebration, multicultural fiesta on Mexican Independence Day in September, not on May 5th. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, we celebrated the ethnic diversity. We had food, and uh, Jim makes German um, cookies, and we have the Swedish ladies rolling their uh, lefse, and then the people that are down the thing doing pupusas and tacos are coming down and saying, well, that looks a lot like a, a, a what do you call it, a taco, yeah, whatever, yes, that, th lots, of, lots of things together. We have food, we have, hi David, we have uh, Mexican um, pupus, or not Mexican, pupu, uh, El Salvadorian pupusas, tacos, um, and Swedish dancers and fiddlers and Aztec dancers. We've tried to do a broad scale of what it means. And if you go to our next thing, is that you put a pin on where you come from and you can say that we felt included because this celebration in our community was led and directed by Ever and a lot of us underneath. And it has now been, we started with a few hundred people and the last one's been well over a thousand people have been in attendance. So we're planning for next September, so do come to attend our uh, festival in mid-September in St. James. So the next piece is, again, uh, we wanted to learn more about food. So we took all of our churches and said, Sunday, we're going to do a meal. So we did a, a Salvadorian meal, Mexican, Guatemalan, and Scandinavian on different Sundays. The last Sunday was out at uh, one of the Svedals, and it was a Swedish, Swedish meal there. The best part our Latinx folks were helping to serve the, the Swedish food. And when we had El Salvadorian and Mexican, it was the exact opposite. We were together. We shared our culture. We shared our history. Pushback? Yes, we did. There were some negative comments said about some of the people coming to the various different things. 
Was it, was it challenging? Yes. Was it delightful and um, rewarding? Yes. Okay, then telling your story, hearing Sergio's story, hearing our immigration stories. So, um, and this is, my, this is our Pat right here, and um, went together, and over 40 people, we have their stories. We have stories in our book that are from our county of people coming and ICE coming in, separating the family, and family separation, and um, negative immigration pieces. We have stories of people coming from Sweden at the turn of this century and everything in between. They're all stories. And so we wrote that and we have a hardcover book, Your Story, My Story, Our Story, that is telling the stories of people that live and live and breathe in our community. It was a wonderful way. And if you flip to the next slide, I felt that I was a little grain. This is our Marta. And no one really gave importance to myself or my culture. We came from different continents, different situations, but we have something in common that propelled us to be here. And now I feel a part of you. You've heard my story, and I've heard yours. It's huge. It's huge. And our Marta is, is a, a political, came as a political asylum. Then we wanted to talk and del delve more into this immigration. And we have many people here with the DACA, Deferred Action for Children, and, um, so, and then citizenship. And um, the four panelists there, they talked about um, our Sue Moore. Her daughter-in-law is a doctor. It took years. And she's a doctor from another country. It took years for her to gain her citizenship. Citizenship costs a lot of money, and it's, it's, it's extremely challenging. And so for the people in my community, it's not as easy as just saying, well, just go become a citizen and learn the language. All of those things are challenging in huge mountains. And so, and when we, we heard all about the people that come, they're all the professional people. If you do not have lucky enough in your country to get a degree, but you want to do better by your family. You have absolutely no other options. No other options to be able to come because it's not easy to come and there's only a select few that we want to come and yet our labor needs these people. Our community in St. James, many small rural communities in southern Minnesota are about half the kindergarten population because they've lost population. St. James and Medillia have held their own because we have new people in our community. Hallelujah. Our school is still stable. Our community has, downtown has changed with businesses. But hallelujah, we're not dying. We're going to flourish because I think and hope we have been able to engage that diversity. Um, our Calvo Vancey Hispana, I am so proud of this group of, of people. They started in the plant. And our plant, local plant, gives scholarships to students. These people wanted their kids to go on to school and have opportunity. They sold pupusas and um, did everything they could to raise money. And at the end of the day, they gave more scholarships in our high school, this small group of Latinx people, than even the plant did. Um, they are, were understanding and concerned about um, their seniors. So they started our golden age, which was a support piece. And this is all of the seniors that are living with their family were isolated and spoke Spanish. Our Wellspring and our Vine people and the nutrition people wrapped around and they did week, weekly or twice monthly events to support that. Then Day of the Dead is a very important celebration. Well, my goodness, our Lutheran, Swedish Lutheran Church had Day of the Dead and our Uniting Culture showed up to help support that particular activity. There's nothing like having a Day of the Dead at the Lutheran, Swedish Lutheran kind of church. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> then um, our community became the recipient of an art place project, and we were rece received, the town did, a plot of land. What were we going to do with that land? Well, this group was in place to help determine what that plot of land was going to be used. And most recently, um, uh, the school is the fiscal host for them, so it runs through my office. $20,000 they receive for COVID support, 
and COVID education for immunizations so that our population would have people they trusted to give them public health information about the last two years. Next slide. Um, equity work. Now we're going below the line. We're talking about deeper issues. We did working out loud circles and about becoming anti-racist. And we had a fair number of people gr in groups of four to five that met over the course of two to three months to discuss this. And this is one of a very pivotal uh, heart learning activity for me. Um, We've done um, an equity summit, and we did it locally. We have regional equity summits, but we did one locally, and thanks to some of our business, including Pioneer Bank, that helped to plan, present, and pay for doing a local equity summit. We took, um, and we've participated in others and brought that programming and did things through Community Ed. So Pat has done some individual classes as well as others that we've run through Community Ed. and. For those working in schools, we did a social justice scholarship for our high school student, uh, students that are working and been in community in that particular area. Next slide. Our school, the ripple effects out into community of the work that's happened. Well, in the school, we, ha we have uh, started with an equity team among the staff. Um, our superintendent just wrote for a Teachers of Color grant and received $700,000 to help to fully pay for students of color to become teachers to come back and teach in our schools. And they just wrote for another one and just received another one, and that is for adults in community, another 700,000, to be able that if you're a pair of staff or if you're someone in community that has passed high school age and wants to go back to school and teach, because we need teachers and we need teachers of color. Um, staff development. Our school has worked on the IDI, which is the Intercultural Developmental Inventory. Our staff, number of our staff have taken that, our school board. We have now um, had a whole year of training and um, uh, equity training. And we have had a social justice club at school. And those, our students did a Black Lives Matter rally. And the Black Lives Matter rally in town we happened to have the Minnesota Teachers of the Year who were uh, circulating the state and they were asked to speak. So uh, Bukata, uh, many of you know in St. James was the speaker, and we also had all of the candidates for Minnesota Teacher of the Year speak at our Black Lives Rally Mally, uh, that matter in St. James, and it was all organized by our high school students. I'm so proud of our kids. Community education is the fiscal host for Uniting Cultures and Covovencia Hispana, and that we will underwrite and support all of that work. Next slide. Our Rotary Club did white fragility. Jim and I are Rotarians. And we lost a Rotarian because of it. Um, local sponsorships, and thank you to Pioneer Bank, helped to sponsor our local summit. Local churches have done study groups, and our Marta, at my church, she came and spoke as part of a sermon telling her story of being from El Salvador, and all of it was interpreted by her son as part of our Sunday service. Next slide. Uniting Cultures Through COVID has been working hand in hand with our, our backpack, the food giveaway, and the food shelf through all of the COVID. There's many people that have helped to deliver packages and making sure that the food insecure families in our community that they are wrapped around. Our city has done bilingual publications and signage. Um, they help to plan and support our equity summit. Um, support for Latinx businesses and entrepreneurs and a handyman certificate and picking up and how you repair your home, which then worked with Covivancia Hispana to provide the translation for the city for some of those grants. Next slide. So what's in it and what are we doing currently? Well, currently, Thank you to Pat, she wrote a grant and we're working with the University of Minnesota Morris on a storytelling project. The interesting thing is that if you go to our historical society, where does it start? It starts when the people like me came here. What happened prior to that? Are we understanding and celebrating our indigenous heritage and where is that at? So this is some of the things that we're wanting to delve into. Um, Pat wrote to the Smithsonian there was a, problem, or a, a program that um, 
highlighted what small towns are doing as a traveling exhibit coming up. And we got accepted to be a part of a traveling exhibit by the Smithsonian on the work in small towns. Um, a few weeks ago, we have a Ukrainian foreign exchange students. We have a woman from Russia who works at her VA clinic as a, a physician's assistant. And her, one of her best friends is from Ukraine who was down from Alpha, Minnesota, if you know where that's at. And um, then I work with um, uh, a gal who is married to a Romanian who works at our hospital as a uh, radiographer. They all spoke about what was happening in Ukraine. And that night in St. James, we were able to raise over $7,000 for Ukrainian relief. Um, we are working on a world sculpture to be placed at the center of our plaza. And this world sculpture, we're hoping to have 23 languages representing community to be in the center of the plaza that was planned and organized with input from our Latinx community to celebrate that you are welcome here in St. James in languages. So we have um, commissioned that with one of our local metal artists and we're gonna be working on paying for it, anybody who wants to help pay for it. <laughs> and so that's, we're working on that and we're hoping to open, grand open that at our uh, uh, fiesta this fall. And I'm very excited. I work in the high school and we have a pay it forward trip. And our pay it forward trip is our high school students and I work with um, Maple River, um, LCWM, and uh, Truman, St. James, and Medillia schools. And we're taking high school students on this trip. And this time we're doing an indigenous persons trip and we are going to go to St. Peter and we're going to the hanging site here in Mankato. We're going to be going to the Lower Sioux Agency and we're going to celebrate the powwow with them in June and learn. We are going to go out to Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, and we are going to end up at Crazy Horse and the museum out in uh, Rapid City in June. So we are highlighting, and that kind of parallels understanding and going deeper into um, other indigenous stories. Um, so you just got to do it. It's, you know, it start. And it is about layering. It isn't about just one thing, but it's about multiple things. Um, and you build on past initiatives. You start and you keep going. Ask and engage and know that we have to understand and do personal work to understand our cultural lens and others so we can recognize and be respectful of others. And plan. We had lots of help with strategic planning, um, vision, missioning, prioritizing, all of those kinds of meeting kinds of things in order to formalize our work. And um, we need to continue to engage leadership and leadership changes. And that's something that's ongoing. So it's not a one done. Relationships are ongoing. And understand that you will have gatekeepers, that people that will keep things from happening. And you need, need a group of champions. This is not one or two people, but it was the tipping point of enough people that wanted and passionately believed that we could make our community better by engaging all people. And um, make those connections and then this outside partnerships. And so I wanted to give credit to where credit is due. So the next slide is all of the people that have poured into since Uniting Culture started, where we have received not just, in, we've had great support internally in community. This is our external partners. Region 9, hats off to Region 9 without their beginning and their work with the Y making this. This was the catalyst on this particular start. And their work with extension and uh, civic engagement, all of our training and our strategic planning it was done, many of it by Toby Spanier, who was part of all of these projects. Um, RSDP, we've had multiple grants and support from that piece. Um, Blandin, Blandin is, is um, in fact, some of the money that we are still working off of is Blandin support dollars working in partnership with these others. We have had $20,000 for Uniting Cultures from the Southern Minnesota Initiative Foundation. Um, FREC, and um, that's another training and support and education. Um, Minnesota Humanities gave us a grant and helped to fund our book. Prairie Lakes Regional Arts Council, all of the fast entertainment or the great, great multiple pieces of it, $7,000 is coming from the Prairie Lakes Regional Arts Council and then money that we couldn't spend during the uh, COVID, we are now putting into our sculpture. 
and um, MSU Diversity and Equity at the college, they're helping to pay for our Fiesta advertising. To name a few, once you start, this work is new, it's exciting, and it's happening all over. Thank heavens. We have a diverse nation, a diverse world. We have many people, and if we all work together, that partnership, we can be great because we recognize the talents and abilities of all people rather than just the ones that have lived and worked and been in our little corner. There's more, to, more that we can do, and how do we celebrate that? It's, it's a team. And um, my last story is, this is what's happened. If you want to flip to the next slide. To me, this is one of the most pivotal things that has happened in St. James. And this is what has happened when you invest in people. Laura Mavarshian was a young girl, and her parents came to our county undocumented for a job to work in our food processing plants. She felt that coming to St. James, her track coach, her music teacher, this woman took her parents and helped to teach them English. This woman gave her a job. This person helped them with food insecurity. All of these people across, and these are her uncles, gave her a grounding that she never would have had. She left, and their family left our community. She has become very successful and now lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Her commitment to what this community gave to her, that she wanted to give back to St. James. So she wanted to commission a mural, and this stands at the corner of the intersection of our town. She paid $40,000 to have another undocumented female, to actually two, both Pam and um, Amy came to St. James as undocumented females. And they painted this mural to celebrate what St. James had done for them. And these people, these, this is our ever, this is our Marta, this is who, these are, this was our first school board, Latinx school board. These are our people. This is our Spanish teacher at school. And then this represents our, our wrestling programs, our kids programs, our city, um, our bakery, our uh, fire department, all the things that are in our community, all done and supported. And the coolest thing is that Laura, after 30 or 40 years living a successful life in Atlanta, Georgia, chose to give back to St. James that two weeks after this mural, this is our Laura, this was commissioned, she gained citizenship. Our undocumented and our people in our community are well worth knowing and they have gifts untold to give. How do we celebrate who we are and to be able to move us forward? So thank you and I challenge you. We, ha we don't have all the answers, but at least we're willing to take a step to try. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as Jim does. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I think we'll, we'll open it up almost uh, more before I might ask the speakers that are able to stick around. We'll grab our, our beer, wine, cheese, meat, crackers, and we'll sit down and let's continue the conversation and share some more stories. You know, I have a few, few more notes, and, and uh, I have to take the privilege to, uh, to share some of this. Thinking about, you know, Sue, as she, as she tells the story, and May we all have the enthusiasm and energy that Sue has when it comes to our organizations. Yeah. <laughs> May we all try to, to carry that enthusiasm because it radiates. And, and when it radiates that positivity, uh, it just makes you want to get up and do something. You know, we uh, refer in the, the food and egg space about a lot of NIMBYs, not in my backyard. How can we say there's a place right here in our community, in our town, in your backyard? What are you willing to do? In business, there's a term, innovate or die, right? If you're not making money, it's going to be really hard to stay in business. How can we think of our communities as adapt and thrive, right? There's a lot of changes. Now, a lot of these changes are difficult. You lose a rotary member over it, right? 
I think it's now at that time and that, that inflection point in our society to where let's get rid of those members, right? Let's take that next step. They'll learn. Perhaps they'll be back. Hopefully they'll be back. But I don't think there's a place now in our communities and our organizations to, to accept racism and the, the lack of perspective to, uh, to uh, better the community. Think about those in your community, in your organization, in your network that missed out from this conversation today. We'll have the video. I need your name and email. We'll uh, send videos out and we'll have them on the Green Seam website for those to share. But if I don't know who you are or I don't have your information, I can't get a hold of you. So think about those people that need to be in that next room. We'll work on a next date. I need your feedback. What, what, what should we dive deeper into? Now that we've had two sessions, is it now bringing the leaders of business and community leaders together and, and talking about, hey, businesses, how can we collectively work on something? Communities, how can we collectively work on something? Um, we're not doing this alone. We're in this together. And thank you again, Sue, for, for that information. And um, just another help, heartfelt thank you. This is, this is really cool. Thank you to all our speakers.